We'll talk first about programmable logic and then move on to sequential logic design. Um, so for programmable logic, the, what we've been doing so far is we've been implementing designs based on a few different methods. Um, most of them come out to having this system where we create product terms and combine them. So for example, if you had a truth table, you might say, you know, we could use the K-map we might simplify some of them and end up with some form that um, we can then draw in a schematic. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, for example, okay, this is A and C complement plus B and C. Um, so in the first lab, you were using discrete logic gates where we had physical packages you put in the circuit board and wire them up. And that's initially how everything was done, is you had these discrete chips and you would have to wire it. So if you wanted to build an alarm system or you know whatever, you had to do this work, create those, and then you would physically wire up an AND gate with an OR gate um, and you know NOT gates as needed. So what people realized is that for the most part, the structure is the same. Um, and so an easy way to do this is they created what are called programmable logic arrays, or PLAs. So with a programmable logic array, what we can see is say we have two inputs, A and B, um, and two outputs, X and Y. Um, so with the programmable logic array, how you can see this is that I've cr created the two variables, A and A complement here, um, as well as B and B complement. Um, and then what they do is they have this structure such that any of the variables can be added to this multiple input AND gate. So when you look at this, this is actually equivalent to up to a four input AND gate. Um, we just draw one wire to keep it a little neater. And this is a four input OR gate. Um, so this is sort of, to give you a little better idea of what it looks like, here's a really simple example where we have, um, we have some of the inputs, so A and B. And again, we create A, A complement, B, B complement. Um, and then it goes to four input AND gate, and the outputs are combined in an OR gate. So to create some sort of circuit, um, what you have to do is obviously what this is implementing right now is A and A complement and B and B complement. And that this is implementing the same thing. So on the chip, physically, there's these fuses. And these fuses um, are just like you know a household fuse or whatever, something that can be blown and open the circuit. So for example, if I blow this fuse and blow this fuse, and maybe blow this fuse and this fuse, um, what I get instead is that I'm it, I, I'm disconnecting A from this gate, and this pin's just pulled to one, so you can ignore it. Um, and I'm disconnecting B, and again, you can ignore it. So what ends up getting implemented is one, because this is blown, and A complement, and no, B is blown, so that's one, and B complement. Um, so then this product term here is A and B, A complement and B complement. In a similar way, I've blown some fuses here, um, so I've selected to only allow, well, that was stupid, because now it's B and B complement, which obviously won't do anything. Um, but you get the idea. So using this programmable logic, you can just select what gets connected. You don't have to wire all these things together. Um, so the first method that was created was this programmable logic array, where you could program, for example, you could say, all right, I'm going to connect to this gate, A and B. Um, so this point is now A and B. Um, and then maybe to this next gate, and these are not connected. Um, and you could say to the next gate, I'll connect A complement and B. So then this is A complement and B. Um, and you know, to this gate, Again, you just choose whatever you want. Um, and then maybe this final one, I'm just not going to use it all, so nothing's connected. 
and this is A and B complex. And then again, you can select how they get or. So I have these various product terms, and say output X is going to be, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm going to use A and B, so X equals A and B plus this one, A and B complement. And then Y, say, is equal just to that one, A complement and B. So everything's uh, flexible in how you connect stuff up. So this is what was called programmable logic arrays, and these are disconnected. So I'll draw X's. Um, programmable logic arrays is what the very first attempt at this uh, programmable design was. So the next thing that was used was actually, um, oops, and this acronym's wrong, this should be PAL, P -A -L. Uh, programmable array logic. And in programmable array logic, which is like was shown before, these are not programmable, these are fixed. So for example, you always have, um, in this case, those two AND gates are always or together, and that's just it. You don't have this choice of before you could choose which product terms are combined and how they're combined. Um, so again, this, these two examples are equivalent. So when I show a single line here, what I'm really saying is there's four possible inputs to that AND gate depending on what's connected. Um, and there's fuses at each interconnection here. So the fuses can be blown with an X or connected with a dot. Um, so you might have you know, something like that, choosing how, what, how, what your output's going to be based on. So again, say this was A and B, and this was F. What we'd have here is this term here has A complement and B complement, and this one here is A and B. Thus the output F is A complement and B complement, chord with A and B. Um, so that's how we would use programmable array logic, which was the next step. Those got fairly popular, um, because you just had one, I think there's a picture, one physical chip there, and you know, you could replace, rather than having 20 individual gates you're wiring together, you just plop that down and you're done. So more realistic versions, the one showed here only had that single output. Um, more often what you have is multiple outputs because you may be implementing a few different things. And again, in programmable array logic, you only have this choice that say F1, F2, and F1 is always oring these two terms together. F2 is always oring those two terms together. So you have a limit of how many product terms can be in each output. Um, in this case, it's two. If you need more than two, you're just screwed. You can't do anything inside the chip. Um, you could you know, add an external OR gate or something if you really wanted to or feed stuff back, but that's the limit. Um, so again, that's a fairly simple example where we just have the two inputs. We have A and B, and again, we're creating A and A complement, and B and B complement. So this is when we were doing the design process easier, earlier, sorry, and we would say design, you know, design this in some of products notation, assuming that complements are available. Um, this is where this idea comes from, because when you implement it in devices like this, you do have A and you have A complements available to you, it just doesn't matter which you use because they're both created and you can choose how you can combine them. Um, so a larger, slightly larger array might look something like this. Here I have four inputs, so this is getting more towards you know the stuff we've actually been doing. We have four inputs and each output can have up to four product terms that you can combine any of those you want. Um, so again, when we were doing the K-maps earlier, this is where we get the simplification from, is when you simplify, you have to simplify it to four product terms to use this type of device. In this case, different devices have different numbers allowed, um, because if you have more than four, there's just nothing you can do. So again, this is implementing sort of a sum of products. Um, because we have a 
we have an AND gate here um, that creates these products, and then we sum them together with an OR gate. And we have three outputs in this example. So that's um, programmable array logic versus programmable logic array. So with PAL, um, you can choose what inputs go to the product terms, but then how those product terms are combined is fixed. With PLA, everything's uh, flexible. There's a good chance, though, I mean, somewhere I have a description, <laughs> that both PLAs were never very popular. PALs, there's almost zero chance in your life you would ever see them. Um, you'll never see them used in anything recent. And you know, maybe if you're repairing something from the 70s or 80s, you'd run into them, but that's more or less it. Um, you can see that I mean, they were first released in 78, and since then there's newer technology that's completely taken over. And the next step in technology, and what we'll be using in this class, is called complex programmable logic devices, CPLDs. Um, with CPLDs, they have a slightly different structure. And that structure is that we have a number of inputs and outputs. So these are sort of I-O pins here. These are I-O pins here. I-O pins here. I-O pins here. Um, and those I-O pins connect up to some what they call macro cells. So each macro cell is very similar to one of those PAL devices we talked about earlier. Um, it's similar to that in that it implements a number of, you can create a number of product terms and combine them together, create an output. So each macro cell can implement um, some sort of function. And the inputs and outputs of the macro cell are connected to this um, sort of this common bus. And it's programmable how you connect them. Um, in some limited way. So you can't connect any signal to anywhere directly. But for the most part, you can, for instance, implement a function here and feed the output to another macro cell somewhere else and then feed that to the output. So that was the next step in programmable logic, is CPLD. So it's sort of an upgrade from what they were previously using, these PAL devices. But um, there is a limitation. As you start to get bigger and bigger, um, this the sort of architecture here, this common bus, becomes a problem. Um, as you try to get, you know, millions of macro cells all along the bus, and how do you all interconnect them? So almost sort of simultaneously to that development, there's what we call field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. Um, and these are, these can be huge. You can implement, easily implement whole computers on one FPGA device. Um, to give you an idea, these type of devices, you can have, the ones we'll be using are equivalent to about 800 logic gates available on them. Um, you can get several thousand fairly simply. Uh, FPGAs, you'd be hard pressed to find one smaller than about 100,000. It just doesn't exist. A million gates is pretty common now. I mean, that's a pretty cheap device. Um, and you can easily get much higher than that if you, if you need them. So with FPGAs, what we have is we have programmable logic blocks, um, and they're just chucked down, basically, on what they call this mesh, this routing mesh. Um, so each of these reddish boxes here are switchable interconnects. And the switchable interconnects let you route either the data out of them, somewhere to the next data, or across the whole chip. So the reason this is advantageous to the CPLD architecture is um, here we sort of directly have these macro cells connected to I.O. and then connected to the central bus. Um, here, it's you can easily see how you can just expand this. You can just keep growing them. And it there's no real architectural problem because each one is more or less just connected within its own little area. Um, and potentially, you can route signals across the whole bus if you need to. Um, but because all of these interconnects are switchable, we don't have the problem here that, for example, if you had, you know, a thousand macro cells in a row, some of those data lines go between all possible macro cells. Um, so physically, it's just hard to switch the data to have it move that far very quickly. 
with FPGAs, you know, you can choose. You can say, I'm just going to route some data here. Um, I'm going to route some data here, you know, way across the chip. Um, and everything's really manageable that way. So as I showed quickly earlier, to give you an idea of the history of it, um, even these newer technologies are fairly mature by now. Um, and that also means pretty cheap and easy to use for us, which is good. Uh, so in sort of 84 and 85 is where the CPLD and FPGAs were introduced. Um, the name in brackets is the company that invented slash released them for the first time. So GLA, or GAL, um, is like a PLA, but you can reprogram it a number of times. P or PAL, sorry. A PAL, you program it once and you're done, so don't screw up. The GAL lets you reprogram it, so for development you can test something, reprogram it, etc. Um, CPLDs and FPGAs are also all reprogrammable, so you can try different designs out, out there. Um, both of these companies now, Altera and Xilinx, make both CPLDs and FPGAs. Um, we're actually going to be using a Xilinx CPLD in the lab tomorrow. Um, doesn't really matter, per se, which one you use anymore. Um, so this is a photo of the board I showed you yesterday. Um, and this is what we'll be experimenting with programmable logic on. Um, so on the back side of it, I didn't even put a photo of it. On the back side, there's a small chip, and that's the CPLD. Um, so that's the complex programmable logic device. And that CPLD connects to a bunch of stuff. It connects to, through the USB, there's a programming interface. Um, it connects to your switches, so there's five switches here. It connects to your LEDs, so there's some direct LEDs here. Um, there's a seven-segment display up here, too, you can use for counting, and hopefully we'll get time to use that. It's a little more complex. Um, and there's also a reset switch that we'll kind of talk about later in sequential logic design. Um, and finally, there's this breadboard area in the middle. So in the first lab, we used the breadboard. You know, we put down individual AND gates or whatever. Um, if you want to implement other logic or, you know, basically anything, you can fit it in the breadboard and, um, you know, you can put an IC down, wire it up so there's sort of power and ground available here. Um, Again, just like the first lab we did, as well as there's the switches and the outputs also connect um, here. So, you know, you can wire up some additional logic that you can't implement in the CPLD or you don't want to, and so forth. Um, to give you an idea, the, the CPLD we're, we'll be using was basically introduced in 1996. Um, so it's fairly mat very mature by now. And the cost of it in, you know, quantities we're buying, it's, I believe, under $2 for that chip. Um, and it's equivalent to around 800 usable gates are present in it. So you can do fairly large designs. When we were talking about the delay earlier of how much, you know, does a gate delay add, um, this particular device, it's around five nanoseconds from routing something from the input <coughs> to the output um, pin. And you can use it almost up, you can use it up to 178 megahertz with a clock. Again, we'll talk about some of that stuff later on. Um, so what I showed before with the CPLD architecture, this is sort of a generic diagram. This is from the data sheet for that specific device. Um, so you can see the same sort of stuff. So we have these I.O. blocks here. So this is your input-output pins. Um, this, you know, fast connect to switch matrix. So this is that central bus I was talking about, this central switching matrix. Um, and then we have the macro cells. So there's a bunch of macro cells um, given to you here. So what each of those macro cells look like, so there's 36 of these and the one we'll be using, um, is this. So you can see, again, on this side here, 
This obviously looks extremely familiar to what I was showing. We have some inputs, and you generate the input and its complement, um, and you have these product terms created by AND gates. So again, you program you know, what you want to go into the various product terms. Um, they have this product term allocator, which is basically you can switch how the product terms are used. Um, and we have here a big OR gate, you can see. So that part of it looks extremely similar to the PAL or PLD, um, PAL or PLA devices we were talking about before. In addition to that, though, in addition to this, you know, this additional rarity matrix that makes them easier or better to use, um, they also give you some sequential logic devices we'll be talking about today. Um, and these sequential logic will let you do stuff like implementing counters, implementing state machines, and other fairly simple, but you know, enough to do at least the project in the class and some of the labs and some other things if you want to experiment. Um, it has a little bit of power. So to give you an idea how we design for it, um, here I've done, uh, I'm going to implement sort of a light chaser thing. So using that same software we've been using in the lab for simulation, um, you can just draw the schematic. So here actually what I've done is I have a counter and a decoder. Um, so the decoder will select each output in sequence in this case. Um, instead of simulating, what you do is you use sort of before we were always using this tab, this simulation tab. Um, there's another option in the software called implementation and it takes your schematic and sort of figures out how it can map it to all of these macro cells and how it has to interconnect everything. Um, once you run it, it'll tell you how much of the device you've used. So in this example, it's saying, okay, you've used 59% of the macro cells. Um, and a lot of that's because I'm using uh, input and output. How much of the product terms you've used, so 22%, so that's sort of all the AND gates connecting together, again, the idea of product terms. And how many registers we've used, which is within the sequential logic. That'll sort of start making more sense. Um, and finally, you just download it with running a program and it loads it. So once you have that, um, and this, it moves quite slow, but you can see it'll cycle through the various lights. Um, so in that way, you don't have to go through this whole exercise of wiring everything up with physical logic chips. When you're doing the design entry, um, you have your choice of either schematic-based or language-based design. So schematic-based is what we'll almost entirely be doing in this class. And that's where we will draw you know, a schematic. We'll say, I want an OR gate. I want this. I want that. And you connect it up. The other way you can specify designs is there's actual special programming language for these type of devices. Um, two of them of interest are Verilog and VHDL. These same boards and all that software will work with those programming languages um, in FPGAs and larger devices and in companies. What you'll be entirely using is programming language based. You would never do schematic entry, um, but the process is the same of implementing it, downloading it, etc. So the schematic entry is a very good introduction. Um, I only say that as if on your own you're interested in it. I'll give some links, but there's various websites that go through how to use these languages. Verilog is the one that's probably more used in industry, um, although they both do get used. It's worthwhile knowing both of them. And there's some links to tutorials. And all the tools, again, that we use are totally free, so you can just download them if you really want. 